name is Holly Tootle. I'm the co-chair of the workshop and also the chair of the second session. And this paper was written by Professor Margaret Jackson and Mr. Julius Wigginford. Margaret is Professor of Computer Law and Director of Law Discipline from the School of Accounting and Law. Margaret is the author of Views on Data Protection in Australia, published by the Law Book Company in 2001 and a practical guide to protecting confidential business information in 2003. Margaret is a member of the Smart Internet Technology Cooperative Research Centre and is involved in the Trust, Privacy, Identity and Security Research Stream. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the previous speakers for um, covering most of what I'm going to be talking about, but <laughs> sitting there is like ticking off point after point after point. So some of it you may have heard before, so, uh, but I'll see how it goes. Um, I'm sure they didn't mean to do it. <laughs> what I, what, what this paper looked at um, was a number of things, but it also looked at the UK Identity Card Act, which has recently been passed. Looked at some of the problems with that particular piece of legislation, and then tried to look at whether that type of act would work here, and also looked at uh, the access card, which uh, you've heard a little bit about already. I'm not going to spend much time on, on previous uh, ID card proposals. Uh, you're probably aware that uh, there are identity ration cards during the war, Second World War. Um, you're, we've, we've heard a little bit about the Australian card. Um, and uh, we've heard a little bit about Australian card too, which was the proposals that uh, started to surface after the July London bombings in, uh, in 2005 where Beatty began to, uh, Premier Beatty from Queensland uh, was interviewed and said he thought it would be a good idea. Howard was non-committal, which was taken as Howard supports it. And then gradually he began to, to uh, become to warm to the idea of another card. Until January when uh, Ruddick announced he was setting up an inquiry. Uh, that particular inquiry was shelved in April 2006, so we never quite knew what this marvellous uh, Australian Card 2 was ever going to do and, and look like. And you've heard about the uh, Human Services Smart Card, which is now called the Access Card, and I will come back to, uh, to talk about that. I wanted to concentrate a little bit on the, the UK Act, UK Identity Cards Act 2006 which was first um, proposed in April 2004. Um, it then sort of, uh, they lost a lot of ground, but um, uh, it was, uh, then there was a, um, uh, an election. And in 2005, in, in uh, May, it was uh, started up again, and of course the London bombings provided the real impetus led to, uh, to move forward with this. Its purposes are there, Section uh, 1 of the Act says its purpose is to provide a convenient method for individuals to prove facts about themselves, which is nice. And it's the provision of a secure and reliable method for facts about individuals to be verified in the, in the public interest. Now, for something in the public interest is quite a broad term. It's in the interest of national security uh, required for the purposes of the prevention or detection of crime, enforcement of immigration controls, enforcement of, of corruption <coughs> and working or employment, and for securing the efficient and effective provision of public service. So I don't think they missed out anything. Quite a, quite a good uh, live um, purpose. The, uh, I really didn't think we'd ever actually get through it. It's certainly, uh, criticism of this particular act, it was quite well written and quite articulate, but um, it, it really it was passed in, um, at the end of March this year. A lot of information is collected under this, uh, under this legislation. Um, we, uh, if you're over 16 and you're residing in the UK, you will have to provide in the fullness of time when it comes into operation, your names, date of birth, place of birth, gender, physical characteristics, some biometric information, which is, can include a range of things, every residential address with a 
date of their nationality, uh, all the identity card numbers that you might have, passport numbers, driver numbers, all of those numbers. Um, information about how the information was validated to go into the uh, register in the first place. Steps taken by authorities to, to uh, check identity. Security information relating to access to the register. Um, and information about the number of times in which information from the register, which goes with the card, uh, has been accessed and provided to other people. Always such a worrying, <coughs> a worrying uh, phrase, how it's been provided to other people. Uh, Section 10 provides uh, requirements for updating the personal information that is going to be stored on the register that goes with the card. What is more worrying is that the Secretary of State appears to be the only person who has the power to correct that data. So requirements are placed on, on individuals to update the information, but they don't appear to have the right to, um, to correct any data that might be there about them. There are also some sections of, that, in the public interest, allow uh, government agencies to access uh, the register and personal details, and the individual's consent is not required for that. Secretary of State is able to uh, enforce registration so that you must uh, provide personal details to go on to the, uh, the data register. Uh, has some offences for the possession of false identity. It prohibits compulsory production of the card. However, you have to use the card when you're accessing public services, so uh, it's going to be tricky not to have the card. It does not provide for a time limit on storage of personal information. So if personal information could be stored for a very long time uh, without limit. It does not provide, as I said earlier, for right of access to the register by individuals. And it does not provide a requirement that an individual consents to the provision of data about them by third parties. So there's a number of uh, sections in the Act that allow the government to collect information from third parties without consent of the individual. It is, well the Act itself doesn't allow this, it is proposed by the government that up to 265 government departments will have access to the data register and that about 44,000 private sector organisations will be able to access the register. I haven't quite worked out how and technically your consent is going to be required for private sector organisations to be to access it, but there's still a lot of work to be done. But that's a large sort of vision for how many people are going to be able to access information that is about individuals stored on this register. The government says that the identity card will help prevent crime related to false identities will enable people to access current services more quickly, will provide a waterproof, a watertight proof of identity for use in everyday transactions and travel, and will provide a means of providing more government services. It seemed to start off as a means of just providing more efficient services by the government, and then it began to expand into uh, lots of other things that they could think of. There were two very good um, Criticisms of the uh, the bill as, as it was going through, and they're worthwhile having a look at if you're interested. UK Information Commissioner uh, has had uh, produced a report, and the other one was the London School of Economics, a very detailed report of uh, some of the criticisms that they had about this particular legislation. The UK Information Commissioner was very concerned about a number of things. Uh, one of the concerns was the extent of the information that's required. So it's not just you know, name and address and things mark that might go in your passport, it's, it's an enormous range of information. Which he thought might be unwarranted and intrusive. It's a nice phrase. The, the breadth of the purposes of the Act. So it's the Act is not just one purpose, it's for a range of purposes. And once you start to sort of Soften the edges about why some information is being collected. You can lead. It can lead to function creep. So 
So this is a very broadly broad map. The technical and administrative arrangements proposed in the Act lack independent oversight. It's uh, the Secretary of State who appears to be doing everything and has the, the power um, and the, um, the, the power to, the, to what operate it. It is not an independent body. It will be um, not, it, it really doesn't have much in the way of independent oversight about how it's going to work. Uh, he's concerned also about the large breadth of organisations which can access the, the register. At the same time, they talk about this, re this register being a very secure register. And that's a little inconsistent. If everybody's got access to it, then really, uh, how secure is it going to be? He's concerned too about the fact that individuals consent to, to um, use of the register to check information. He doesn't really think that it will be freely given specific and form. There's a lot of use to of secondary legislation and uh, lack of privacy impacts. So that to broaden the act, we really don't need to put through separate legislation, we can put through regulations on the Secretary of State account. So it can actually be widened quite easily. The London School of Economics put out two reports, uh, very detailed, particularly uh, the first one that came out in June. Uh, and they did an assessment of the UK identity card bill Stating it was too complex, technically unsafe, overly prescriptive, lacking a foundation of public trust and confidence. But <coughs> what did they know? They did say that they thought uh, it would have no impact on the reduction of identity fraud, in fact, it would lead to greater fraud, would have no impact on private sector fraud, fraud, would not reduce most immigration fraud. Um, and that its only likely effective role would be to reduce social security fraud. They have the figures that the government provided um, of social security fraud, and they're talking about an impact that would affect 1% of social security fraud in the UK. They felt it would be very expensive and um, queried the calculations, and, and that's why it was, it was initially rejected by the House of Lords. So the legislation in the UK uh, is there. Uh, it will start operating in a few years. Uh, they're starting to uh, broaden its operation already. The government really didn't show how it would uh, reduce terrorism and other security threats. Really didn't prove how it would uh, reduce identity fraud and any other areas of fraud. And. Um, if we look at whether something similar was introduced into, uh, into Australia, although our laws are certainly not as strong as the uh, UK data protection laws, this certainly would have an impact on our, well, one would hope that our laws, our privacy laws, would have an impact on this legislation. It would certainly threaten some of the privacy rights. Just to look quickly at what's happening in Australia, we've heard about a number of cards. Um, but we also have to re remember that we all have cards. We all have identity cards now. We've got our passport. We've got our driver's license. We've got our Medicare card. People carry lots of cards. A lot of, uh, there's no concern about that because actually you're using it for a purpose. <coughs> at one stage you had to use your driver's license to get um, a ticket, a, your electronic ticket at the airport. Even now they don't seem to worry about that know how they're checking my identity at the airport that I rock up with and type in myself. But that's, you know, so the use of identity cards is, is something that we are used to. We're not quite used to the broader one that uh, they're talking about. Just to talk briefly about the access card, it started off its life in April 2005 as a human services card, which is nice and warm. Uh, July 2005, it became the government services card. Mm -hmm. Focus on access. Mm -hmm. Not so important. Not so important. No. But actually, we've reflected on what they were trying to do, which is make government services a bit more effective. And at that stage, in the photo, it was going to replace 26 government services cards, and we lost some. <coughs> it was only going to cost 500 billion. January 2006, it was compulsory now for all welfare recipients. It contained biometrics. 
February 2006 to be used via FPOT machines to get your reimbursement from the health services. March, and now these are all taken from the, the releases that have come out from the media, it was going to stop welfare fraud. And of course, disaster relief, new use for it. Every time we have a disaster, we would be able to use this card. It's a question I was that's in the house that just got smashed by the side of the mountain. That one, that one, yeah. But now you're carrying it. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Round your neck. April 2016, <laughs> Cabinet approves a smart car for access to health and welfare services, and it's going to cost approximately 1.1 million. Um, subsequently now referred to as the access card. And I think that it's a warmer, but it's warm. Access card means you've got rights and you're going in to, to get things. The thing is, who can access this card? And um, there was mentioned before about the, the information that's on the website for access card at a glance. I find it very confusing what the, the Minister's uh, website does say. That it says that, that the information is going to be kept across, up to date across Medicare, Central and the Department of Veterans Affairs but it will be a separate registration system from the Department of Veterans Affairs and Medicare. And it's very complicated. I don't think they're clear about who's going to access it and what's, what they're doing. Um, this was just a little chat I did about the purpose and the fact it's going to reduce welfare fraud and replace the 17 card and make patients and payments to patients and um, make welfare payments and it's going to smash red tape and it's going to be useful. So it's got a lot of uses for it. Access, uh, originally the, the media report said it was going to be accessed by tax office and Centrelink and uh, Medicare and Customs. I haven't seen that uh, referred to again, but now we've got Coles and Woolworths, for example, going to be able to access and use the card to make payments. Um, I'm not sure about Safeway. Uh, and there's going to be a data hold which will make it feel good because it's safe to hold. Information, a lot of information is going to be collected and it's going to apply to lots of people, age pensioners, those on welfare, anyone with or study, maternity payments, family tax payments, Medicare. There are a few concerns, probably, just a few. The government, or the governments generally, don't seem to deal well with personal information. Some of you may remember the ICAC reports that came out in the, in the 90s about the unauthorised release of government information, where it said that unauthorised release of personal information was just rife, it was sold, um, and it listed massive abuses of, of um, government databases, uh, where uh, information was just sold for profit. Uh, the Department, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Human Services says the card will deliver significant benefits to government. Not so much a benefit to us, but benefits to government. The Treasurer is quoted as saying the proposed card will contain, contain more information than the Australian card. The head of the task force implementing the proposed card, oh sorry, I had to retype some of this because I lost some of it. Uh, the head of the task force implementing the proposed card resigned. Uh, recently, because he said that uh, there was not going to be the private oversight, the, the, the uh, external independent oversight that uh, had originally been um, suggested. And Ruddick talks about the fact that the smart card development reflects ongoing work on better ensuring people's identities remain secure. And I'm not quite sure how that, <laughs> what they're proposing is going to do that. So some of the quotes are a little worrying. If they, if they use the something like the Identity Card Act uh, as a model here, they're not going to satisfy national security and uh, identity fraud. They're really, it's not, they're not going to be able to achieve that. They might be able to achieve, uh, reduce government services fraud. Um, I suppose the last thing I really wanted to say, because I've run through this fairly quickly, uh, knowing and some of the time constraints we have here today and, and the fact that some of it's been covered. But I think if, if there's going to be serious consideration for an identity scheme and an identity card, there has to be demonstrated in some way that's quite believable 
And actually, you shouldn't attempt to do it all with one card. People are happy to have a number of cards. So we have a number of cards for different purposes and restrict your information. But it'll be interesting to see. One of the problems we're dealing with, and I think the first speaker today mentioned it, is we don't have any details about any of these proposals. I had to spend time going through you know, the media reports and things like that, and they kept changing depending on who, they, who was being interviewed and when they were being interviewed. We have no real information about this, and that's the concern. Okay, thank you very much. I'll ask the obvious question here, and that is, if your, your hypothesis is that the rationale, the, the British card, the rationale for having the card doesn't stand up to um, evidence, mm -hmm. what do you think the rationale for, what is the government's rationale for having the card, because they have access to this information as well? Yeah, I think they started off wanting to improve government services. They thought it would be make more effective provision of services, because they can't seem to work out how to do it any other way. So I think that was really what underpinned them. Then on top of that was layered security concerns, and terrorism, and this card really isn't going to uh, achieve that, but it makes, it makes uh, civilians feel good that the government is doing something about security. So I think that's what it was. Then you have this problem that Everyone gets excited about all this personal data, and so they want more and more people to have access to it. And they sit there and say, how else can we use this information? And you think the same applies to Australia, that it is driven by administrative requirements? Yes. <laughs> so you've got two more questions. Right. Just wondering whether at least the rationale would be cost reduction. Uh, on the government. All the specialists on every department. Mm. And a perfectly reasonable initiative for the point of government is reducing costs by the rate of efficiency. Mm. Uh, and that, I think, is an equally good explanation of the process. However, it underlines the point that I made in the project that no cost is, no cost comes to the community. Mm. No community costs, no individual costs, no social costs. The risk was ever considered from the point of view of the people who were purporting to come. This is confirmed by the consistent statements of government this reduced the cost of government. And there are details. A simple explanation for this sort of legislation with the access card, the anti terrorism legislation, could be that, as it applies in the military field, what's possible becomes necessary. Yes. Yes, we've got this lovely stuff, so let's do something with it. Uh, and that, I think this is what happens too when you have access to a lot of personal information and you can do something new. If, if the problem is just to fix up welfare at all, concentrate on the welfare at all. But the technology is so intensive. The trouble is the government, I mean, you, you see in Victoria the way they handle personal information, so the least Victorian uh, database. Um, and so they, they don't have a history of handling 